Hi and welcome to my OCRA A Level Biology Revision session with me Christine. So today's lesson I want to look at sampling techniques. So random sampling means studying a very small part of a habitat and assuming it contains a representative set of species that can be applied to that whole habitat. So to be able to sample an area you want to map out a grid using two tape measures. You will then select coordinates for the sample points that are going to be used randomly. Now you do this through using a random numbers generator, either a calculator or dice or table. Now it's important to note that wherever those coordinates are going to land is where you're going to place down that frame quadrat. So we place the frame quadrat on the ground and then what we do is we look at what is in that frame quadrat. So if we're looking at plants or slow moving animals like limpets, barnacles, what we're going to do is we're going to identify them and we're going to have to use either a dichotomous key or some pictures so that we can first of all correctly identify them and then count the number of individuals that are present. Now when we look at plants there are different ways that we can record how many there are. So it could be the density cover, the number that are found within that quadrat, it could be the frequency. So if we're looking at the likes of grass or moss, you want to count the number of squares where that species is present or you might look at percentage coverage. So why do we do that? And the reason we do that is it gives us a speedy data collection so we can estimate by eye what it is that we're observing. Now, estimation number in the population, what we tend to do is take the number of the individuals in a sample and divide that by the area of the sample. So it's really important when we're doing random sampling that we get as close as we can to a representative set of data. Now, if we do what's known as non-random sampling, we can do things like opportunistic sampling. This is where we're gonna sample organisms that are conveniently available. Now, we can do this through different methods. Now, there's stratified sampling, where the area population is divided up into groups. So this could be, we're looking at the number of males and females. We could be looking at the types of habitats. Is it grassland? Is it a playing field? Is it a peat bog? And then we're going to do random samples within that area, but it's proportional to the size. So if, for example, I've got a grassland, which is 1,200 meters squared, I need 60% of my samples to come from that grassland area. That should then give me a reasonable number so that I can get that proportional sample to the size of the area. And then we can do systematic sampling. So this is where different areas within a habitat are identified and then sampled separately. So we can use a line transect where we place a tape measure down and then every meter to every two meters, we're going to put our quadrat down. And again, we're going to sample. Or we can put a belt transect where we have two tape measures and we are sampling everything in between those two lines. So that's why it's called a belt transect or the line transect is just what's touching the line. So there are different ways in which we can sample, for example, the animals. So if we want to look at animals that can move around more quickly, then we have to do what's known as the sampling technique relevant to them. So if I'm looking at, for example, organisms that are found in rivers, what I'd want to do is something which is called kick sampling where I'm disturbing the ground in the river and then I have a net that's going to catch that sample and I would then move that to a tree to identify and count. Now you can put a quadrat down into the area that you are wanting to sample. So that way you are controlling the size of the area that you are sampling. Another way that you can do this is through what's known as sweep nets. So when I went to Gamboa and I went to observe the different species that were out there, I was very lucky to have the opportunity to go to try and sample some of the butterflies that were out there. So the Heliconia butterflies, we were going and sampling them and we used sweep nets for that. Now I didn't get the chance to actually catch any myself. However, those who were trained to do so could do it very quickly and very easily. So this allows you to sample insects which can fly around and which would be found in areas of, for example, long grass. 
Now, there are other ways that we can sample organisms that can move around. Things like pitfall traps, where you're going to dig a hole, you're going to place the container into the ground so that the top is level with the ground. So what you want is those organisms to walk along and then fall into your pitfall traps. And you need to ensure that it's covered overnight and that would protect from any rain that might come down. So when I did my thesis, and I was looking at the different species that I was able to identify in different areas of woodlands, this was what I used. I used pitfall traps. Another way that you can sample insects or animals is with regards to tulgren funnels. So the tulgren funnel is where you're going to use a heat and light, which is going to cause any organisms which want to move away. So phototaxis is going to happen. The organism will move away from that heat and light and that will therefore make them move down away towards the bottom of the funnel. And what that will happen or cause is those our organisms to fall into the beaker. And then once you've caught them, you can then identify them and then you would be sampling, for example, organisms which are found in the leaf litter. You can use what's called a putter, another form of a piece of equipment that you could use where you're wanting to trap small invertebrates. Now, what we do with that is there is a straw where you're going to suck the air. Now that air is going to be sucked and moved into your mouth. You do not want to suck in the insects. So therefore it has a mesh surrounding it to ensure that with you sucking, that's going to pull the insects. Now these are normally very small invertebrates in through the other tube down to the jar where you're going to observe them and then release them and put them back out. Now, you need to be thinking about things like reliability when you do the sampling. So is there any sampling bias? Are the selections accidental or deliberately biased? So be careful on that and how that relates to the reliability in the sampling that you have done. Also, is it by chance that you have selected individuals or you have caught individuals that doesn't actually represent the whole population? So it's important that we, when we talk about reliability, that we also talk about the chance in that we might not have got that whole population because we haven't actually got this representative. And also the larger the sample size that we use, the more reliability there is in our data. So if you are given an investigation and they tell you that they took a sample and they got 20 individuals, is that a large sample size enough or should they have done more samples? So if we are measuring, for example, animal abundance, then we would do a process called capture mark release recapture. And it's quite simple how you do this. You capture as many individuals in the area as you can. You would then mark each individual without making them visible to predators. And that's important because you're going to then release them back into the atmosphere, the environment, should I say, that they are within. So you release them back into their habitat. And then what you want to do is you want to recapture them as many as possible and count how many are marked and how many are unmarked. So you can do this with mammals, you can do this with birds, you can do this with snails, you can do this with any type of animal if you're wanting to figure out how the abundance of that organism is, but they need to be able to be given enough time to move away once you've released them before you try and recapture them. Otherwise, it will not give you a good representative of the organisms and therefore the population size. So it's important you note that you would use something like Lincoln's index for this, and this would be your population size equals N1 times N2 over N3. Now, N1 is your number caught and marked initially. N2 is the total number caught on the second occasion. And N3 is the number of marked individuals which were on that recaptured. So that's one way they could ask you about measuring the abundance of animals. But if they're going to ask you about Lincoln's index, they will be expecting you to use the numbers in the data that they've given you. 
The other thing they tend to go down the route of when it comes to sampling is looking at Simpsons Index. So do go back and double check the video that I have done on module four and biodiversity. But just as a reminder, we know that scientists will mathematically calculate the biodiversity present in the habitat using Simpson's index of diversity. Now you will need to be able to use this, you'll be given the equation, but what's really important is that you understand that a value of zero means no diversity. The closer the value is to one, the higher the diversity. So one is infinite diversity, zero, no diversity. So you should get a number between zero and one, and you will be expected to understand if I've got one sample, which gives me a diverse Simpsons index diversity number, which is 0 0.4. And I have another one, which is 0 0.8, which one has the higher diversity and why that would be important. So in this example, you can see my five species of plants. My total number is 85. I would then substitute those numbers in and that would give me a Simpsons index of diversity of 0 0.75. So rounding it and doing it to two significant figures. Now do not round until you get to that end point, that's very important, and then you would draw a conclusion that this would give you a high species biodiversity. So I hope you've liked this video, and if you have, then please click on the like button and subscribe to my channel. And if you haven't already done so, please do check out my revision platform, www.aiqchat.com.